today's World Insight, a suspected early COVID-19 case in the U.S. And again, it's just a belief because the test that I have is what's considered an antibody test. So all it does is prove that at one time I had coronavirus. The promise of a coronavirus treatment and cure. So, so that's sort of our China clinical trial uh, improvement definition. So it has to be uh, improvement over two different uh, clinical uh, uh, levels. And the debate over the virus's origin, all from people in the know. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello, welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. We begin with the latest on the China-U.S. trade relations. The two sides have reaffirmed their commitment to the phase one deal they reached last year. Their chief negotiators spoke over the phone Friday morning, Beijing time. Chinese Vice Premier Liu He was on the call with the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. They also said that they will work together in public health as well as on the economic policies. U.S.-China ties are strained as the origin of the virus has become such a big topic for bilateral ties. Certainly, it is being politicized. In fact, nobody knows the answer. Only the scientists who have been doing research about it could tell us more about the scientific evidence of it. But President Donald Trump referred to the virus as the China virus from the very beginning and despite WHO guidelines against labeling viruses after geographical locations. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, on the other hand, said the coronavirus originated in a research lab in Wuhan as if he knew the evidence and he had the evidence. But later he backed up from the original claim and admitted to lack of evidence. So, there are been reports from different countries tracing cases before the virus officially reached their borders according to the latest information. But whether these cases can survive scientific scrutiny is another question, but I'm sure many of these cases will pop up from different parts of the world for the days, weeks, and months to go. Earlier, I talked to one of those people who said they had the COVID-19 last year before their country officially declared the first case. Michael Melham, the mayor of Belleville from New Jersey in the United States. Melham has tested positive for the antibody test one time and he suggested that he was infected last November with COVID-19. So what does this new development, at least claimed by this mayor, mean for the research about COVID-19? Let's find out. And now we are joined by Michael Melham, mayor of Belleville from New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Mayor, welcome to the program. Good evening. Tell me more about your story. The middle to the end of November, I had suffered really, really bad symptoms, most of the symptoms that are normally associated with coronavirus. And the reason why I believe that, and again, it's just a belief because the test that I have is what's considered an antibody test. So all it does is prove that at one time I had coronavirus. But at that time, there was no other time period in the last few months that I had ever been where just a really bad sore throat early on, but that quickly evolved to a, a high fever. I had chills. I had night sweats. I had a lot of body aches. And then when it really got bad was some of the slight hallucinations I had for a day or so. Mm. Did the doctor tell you anything at that time? He just described it as you're going through flu-like symptoms. Mm. More than likely you have a flu. It's viral. There's nothing you can do. I had just come back from a four or five day uh, conference and he thought maybe I was uh, slightly dehydrated uh, or maybe I was just tired. I needed some time to relax. There was absolutely no point to go into his office because a flu is viral. And he said, I can give you a flu test, but chances are that's what you have. And I can't treat you anyway. Besides, mm. you have to just wait to have a rest. Did you have difficulties breathing because a lot of people were having huge difficulty breathing and usually it lasted one or two days, uh, a, a huge amount of sweat uh, during the nighttime? Uh, uh, what about for yours? So I had, I had nearly every single symptom. However, the one symptom I did not have was respiratory issues, mm. but I actually believe that I had treated for that myself. How much the uh, antibody test 
of COVID-19 will be able to trace one's mm -hmm. case a month ahead, months earlier rather. So, uh, and that's a good point to make. There is absolutely no way to definitively know a time period when I was positive. I will tell you this though, the antibody test that I took was a blood test. It's considered a whole blood test. And I will say that it does test for two different antibodies. Yeah. It tests for the IgG, and I believe it's the IgM or the IgA. Uh, the IgG, which is the one that I tested positive for, is the longer lasting antibody. That one proves that it has been in my body for some time period, and my body did not recently fight coronavirus and did yeah. not recently form the immunity. There are a lot of asymptomatic cases. So would your case belong to that and therefore different from what you earlier claim as uh, you were sick in November with COVID-19? Listen, I mean, anything is possible. Hmm. And uh, there's, there's only two options here. The two options are that I was sick with coronavirus when I believe I was in November. That is supported by every single symptom that's currently related to coronavirus. And the fact that I had never been sicker in my 25 year adult life, I have never been that sick before. I described it at that time when I was going through it. I described my symptoms as a, a drug addict or a heroin addict going through withdrawals. That's how bad I was. So that's scenario A. Option B is that I had it more recently and I was asymptomatic. And to that, I say that I know my body very well. I'm in tune with my body. I, I would know if my immune system is fighting something off. I would be fatigued or tired. And then it also stands the reason that the antibody I tested for is the longer lasting antibody. So while there is no empirical evidence or no empirical proof, uh, I could only go by how I felt, what my mm -hmm. symptoms were at that time period. And it makes sense to me and a lot of other people actually. Uh, what about your family members or what about people that are working in the same office with you who you have close contact? Were they having any symptoms? Uh, but as far as family members ago, I've had my mother. My mother's a 77-year-old woman. Yes. Uh, she has been in quarantine now for almost 40 days. Uh, thank thankfully, she's very healthy. Okay. Now, there are a lot of debate, as you may know, Mr. Mayor, as to when uh, and where the virus and the patient zero, and how it jumped from animal to human being. Now, these are mainly questions only scientists could answer, but what do you make of uh, the debate that is going on right now? Well, yeah, you're right. It seems like everybody has an opinion at this point. And really, my, my main inclination to actually go forward was to actually be an advocate for somebody like myself that should be uh, tested for antibodies, and hopefully we can use our antibodies to donate our plasma. Everything else that has transpired since then is something that I don't really weigh into. I, I personally believe that, that governments at all levels, whether it's local, a state, federal, and international, governments at all levels, as well as the media, we really shouldn't be involved in, in the debate of, of origin uh, or where is patient zero. I'd like to leave that for the scientists, yeah. uh, for the doctors, for the people who actually study this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in timelines. Timelines don't matter to me. I know what I felt, and I know when I felt it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, since you were interviewed by the media, I believe the first story probably came out by CNN, it was shaped in a way as if you were the earliest patient zero, quote unquote, at least for now, uh, in the United States. Uh, how do you like the media's cooking up the story? I'm not happy with it. You know, I think it, it lost sight of the initial uh, my initial goal was, like I said, to be an advocate for antibody testing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not happy about what the media claims, nor am I happy with government's claim. Um, you know, our media here has said some things on a local level. Our media here on a state level has said some things. At the federal level, though, you mentioned CNN. CNN came out with a report two days ago talking about more than likely the virus was here before January. Uh, a very reputable publication here in the States called Newsweek. Uh, they came out, they have scientists saying it's been here since September. So, I, you know, I, I don't really like and I don't want and I certainly don't own the patient zero complex because I have received thousands and I say thousands of social media comments, posts and emails from people, one, supporting and encouraging me for not only speaking, but because they went through the same exact thing. So mm -hmm. more than likely, I'm not patient zero. I don't like being patient zero, but nor do I like the media calling me that. I know your city is still suffering from the epidemic, the pandemic. But a lot of other places in the United States are thinking about uh, partial normalcy or even coming back to normalcy. 
yet there are a lot of challenges. So how do you assess the danger and also at the possibility, sir? So you're absolutely right. We are beginning, uh, because we have what they said flattened the curve, we are beginning to come out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no definitive answers as to what we're going to be doing. Here in New Jersey, we take our lead from the governor. The governor sets the standard as to what's open and what's closed. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, some state parks and some uh, golf courses and some open air recreational spaces are now open, but school has been canceled. We will not be going back to school in the next semester until at least September. Uh, that said, because we're 50 states here, uh, everybody's a little different. So there are, there are states in the Midwest that have not been as, as ravaged as we've been. Uh, they're going back to normal a little earlier. They're going to bars and restaurants are now going to be open, uh, whereas we're taking it a little slowly here. Uh, I'm glad to see it. I really am glad to see it. I want to get back to normal as soon as possible. The job of a mayor is very heavy right now during a time of the pandemic. I want to thank you, sir, for your time and also be well and be safe. You, your family, and also your city people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Melham has been highly sought since his revelation, and he has given CGTN, even my home organization, several interviews already. But how should we interpret his claims and the facts? Maybe there's only one credible source, scientific evidence. But for that, we'll have to wait for the scientists to speak up. So stay tuned. We'll bring you more discussion on the scientific solution to COVID-19. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Science is the key for our questions and confusion concerning COVID-19 pandemic. In the past uh, several weeks, we've seen and been hearing about therapeutic treatment about virus. The race to test and manufacture drugs to fight COVID-19 has been ramped up on a global scale. People are looking at life-saving drugs like remdesivir before a vaccine is available. Meanwhile, Chinese medicine also offers possibility in the fight against the virus. To help us break down the complex world of therapeutic treatment, I'm happy earlier to be joined by Dr. Ling Sheng, Dean and Bayer Distinguished Professor of the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Tsinghua University. He helped us to understand the complex world we are in now in terms of therapeutic treatment. I'm joined by Ding Sheng, Dean and Professor from School of Pharmaceutical Sciences with Tsinghua University. Professor Ding, what a pleasure. Likewise. Let me start by mm -hmm. asking you about remdesivir. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess no discussion about therapeutic treatment now can escape the name remdesivir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certain. Tell me more, Professor. How would you assess the effectiveness of this therapeutic treatment? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, uh, the ultimate test uh, for evaluating a drug uh, effectiveness is really a clinical trial, mm. uh, especially uh, the, the late stage uh, phase three clinical trial. That's really about assessing a drug's uh, clinical efficacy. Um, certainly, uh, remdesivir, uh, as we all know, uh, preclinically uh, has uh, perhaps the most solid evidence that can really uh, inhibit uh, this uh, coronavirus mm. and also in animal models uh, uh, was demonstrated to have certain efficacy uh, against uh, a related coronavirus like SARS and MERS. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we had really a uh, big hope uh, for this uh, potential drug. Anthony Fauci, for example, his organization was pretty much leading the trial in the United States mm -hmm. about remdesivir. He apparently very hopeful about uh, finally mm -hmm. a possible treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the one led by Professor Wang Chen here in China was the result termed mm -hmm. as negative. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we also heard about the Stanford University and some of the other entities testing the same mm -hmm. therapeutic treatment than remdesivir. 
but the results seem to be quite varied. Mm -hmm, How mm -hmm. should we understand the differences? Uh, yeah, so uh, from the very uh, recent um, uh, reporting uh, of uh, several different uh, clinical studies of remdesivir, uh, it appears uh, the results or the outcome uh, is a little bit different. Mm. Uh, but I would say overall, actually, um, uh, the results from those clinical studies actually are quite similar. It's uh, impossible to be similar. I mean, you heard about uh, the mm -hmm, results mm -hmm. coming from Professor Wang yeah. Chen's team mm -hmm. saying it is negative, mm -hmm, meaning mm -hmm. it's not necessarily effective, mm -hmm. apparently. But from uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Fauci, it's mm -hmm. actually yeah. quite effective. Yeah. How should we understand this? Yeah, so let, let, let me uh, uh, make it uh, uh, more clear. Okay. Um, the, the outcome or the conclusion of different uh, two major uh, randomized controlled uh, double-blinded trials uh, are actually different. But the overall results or our understanding of this drug actually is quite similar. The difference is actually uh, what we call a clinical endpoint defined by those two studies actually are different. Mm -hmm. in, our, uh, uh, in the study actually conducted in China, uh, we actually um, treat the severe patients and also uh, define the clinical um, uh, define actually patients uh, into six different uh, clinical level uh, for patients actually can improve over two different level we call that time to improvement mm -hmm. so, so that's sort of our China clinical trial uh, improvement definition so it has to be uh, improvement over two different uh, clinical uh, uh, level but in the US uh, the trial endpoint actually in terms of improvement was defined uh, differently or quite differently. Uh, so simply to say it's actually easier to achieve that uh, improvement. Uh, so based on those two different uh, clinical definition, clinical endpoint, mm -hmm. the results actually uh, are different in terms of uh, time to you know, improvement. Thank you so much for the very professional explanation down to earth too. Mm -hmm. But professor, this brought a lot of confusion mm -hmm. to the general public about whether this drug is really helpful or not. Mm -hmm. And also I would assume for those who do not have to deal with drugs every day, mm -hmm. for example, uh, medical personnel at a different department mm -hmm. and different, uh, in different expertise would make them also confused mm -hmm. as to what to apply at what time to mm -hmm. whom. Mm -hmm. Now, at this stage, we are all desperately looking for therapeutic treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are these trials, as we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. really likely to help us? I mean mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. not yeah, meaning yeah. just those in the trials, but rather the general sure. population, mm -hmm. uh, about 7 billion strong we are talking about, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. for the next wave to come, if mm -hmm. there were any. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think what we can uh, really conclude from those uh, early on, uh, those early studies really, uh, remdesivir has certainly has some effect, uh, especially uh, when patients uh, are treated uh, early. Uh, certainly, actually uh, reducing actually uh, uh, hospitalization time mm. uh, for those patients. That was said to be from 15 uh, to 11 days, uh, right? Yeah, roughly. So, so that's actually significant, mm. right? Uh, so, you basically you uh, you can actually uh, the the hospital resources actually uh, are you know. Uh, much less consumed by you know patients, right. uh, um, so that's uh, that's significant. So here's the thing: mm -hmm. what is effectiveness mm -hmm. and what is cure? How mm -hmm. should we understand the two terminologies? It just sounds so, you know, mm -hmm. common these two things mm -hmm. that we use every day. But now, when it comes to real issue, this mm -hmm. become very crucial, Professor. Yeah, certainly. What I I would say, uh, it's not a cure means. Uh, if I had a disease, if I, if I had COVID-19, uh, especially uh, in the severe stage, uh, if I take this medicine, uh, the chance actually um, this molecule, this drug actually can, can cure my disease, the chance is not that high. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean, based on the current clinical study, actually, uh, Got it, it. it doesn't differentiate actually uh, taking the medicine versus not even taking this mm -hmm. drug. Uh, so there's actually no, no difference. That's why we will say it's, it's not a cure. Mm. But it, it may have some effect on certain patient population. Right. 
So that's what we know about, you know, the, the current drug repurposing efforts because early on uh, when we want to find a drug to deal with this, you know, epidemic uh, situation, this emergency, uh, we can only find, we can only hope for, uh, hope to find actually old drugs uh, developed for something else that can be used for, for treating this disease. Mm. Uh, now we know there, there are many of those uh, currently in different mm. clinical studies. Right. None of those actually are that efficacious. They may only address some patient population mm. uh, with certain disease characteristics. Uh, like remdesivir, certainly uh, the drug actually with the most solid evidence, mm -hmm. uh, it, can, uh, it can work, uh, it tar certainly targets uh, this essential uh, uh, viral protein actually important for uh, virus replication. Right. But uh, given uh, the, the clinical studies we know, uh, it has some effect uh, um, and how actually we can better use a drug remain to be further determined. Uh, I think now the, um, the efforts, it's really about uh, doing sort of larger trials mm. to better understand actually which patient population mm. and also perhaps uh, with what type of drug combinations can be used to, to better treat the patient. But this is very complicated process we're mm -hmm. talking about here and it's mm -hmm. very time consuming. Now, the urgency is we mm -hmm. are likely, unfortunately, going to face another wave mm -hmm. of the pandemic, mm -hmm. according to most of the scientists we talked to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. By the winter, coming mm -hmm. winter, mm -hmm. when it is interacting with the flu season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from now until then, we only have a summer and mm -hmm. short autumn. Yeah. Do we mm -hmm. have enough time, Professor, even on this drug? Mm -hmm. uh, given the last few months uh, efforts in terms of how we can, you know, identify the infected individuals, uh, how we can really do, you know, this uh, physical distancing, uh, some other practice yeah. to really isolate, contain, you know, this, uh, this infected mm -hmm. uh, individuals. Uh, actually, overall, the strategy uh, works quite well, certainly with uh, economic, you know, sacrifice. Uh, but certainly now we know at least there's one way to really deal with mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, uh, transmission, this, uh, this infection. On top of that, now we also know uh, we have found and also clinically validated uh, certain drugs like remdesivir showing certain clinical efficacy. Yeah. Uh, in the coming months, certainly we will know how we can really better use them to treat you know, patients. Uh, okay. But also we know now we're doing, uh, we're developing vaccines. Uh, we're isolating uh, the neutralizing antibody from recovered patients. Uh, those actually, like vaccines, uh, like the neutralizing antibodies, uh, those are new, new drugs or new medicine uh, that, that are more specifically developed, discovered and developed for, for COVID-19. Professor Ding, it's not just the, the Western medicine. To most of the Chinese, mm -hmm. it's also the Chinese medicine. Now, mm -hmm. Professor Zhong Nanshan, who is very well respected the epidemiologist in mm -hmm. this country has been pretty much a stand the stage for a Chinese medicine called Lianhua Qingwen. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to translate that mm -hmm. into English. It's mm -hmm. quite poetic, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, traditional Chinese medicine. All right, there we go. Uh, mm -hmm. So how should we understand what Professor Zhong has been talking about, the so-called mm -hmm. effectiveness of this mm -hmm. Chinese medicine? Mm -hmm. And as going the debate mm -hmm. in the world about both the content mm -hmm. and the scientific evidence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as well as the effectiveness of Chinese medicine vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the Western medicine. How should we understand this mm -hmm. idea now? Uh, I think uh, in general, uh, there has been some confusion uh, about the Western medicine and the traditional Chinese medicine. Okay. Uh, certainly, um, the, the two scientific practice is different. For Western medicine, it's really about uh, what we call a re reductionist approach. A disease is caused by a single defined reason, and the drugs actually uh, can really modulate, you know, deal with that particular disease causing mechanism. Mm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively linear, you know, uh, causal relationship. Right. But in Chinese medicine, uh, it's more about holistically how different uh, systems, uh, uh, how, how different organs, tissues, 
uh, interact with each other mm. and, and, and modulate the disease state. Uh, uh, so so uh, I would say both of them uh, has their uh, scientific rigor. Um, and, and you mentioned uh, uh, for treating this COVID-19, uh, uh, what I've heard is really uh, there are uh, a few of those um, traditional Chinese medicine uh, that were uh, used uh, and actually um, uh, tested actually in, in those different clinical settings, whether mm -hmm. it's a mild, moderate disease patient or severe uh, disease mm -hmm. uh, uh, state uh, and demonstrate a certain uh, clinical uh, efficacy. Uh, so ultimately, I think uh, we can really do head-to-head, -head, what we call head-to-head -head comparison. Yeah. For example, remdesivir uh, and also uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, certainly, we can really uh, group, you know, patient uh, um, and actually uh, mm. have them tested by different, ha have them treated by uh, different drugs, uh, whether it's a, a single molecule like remdesivir or it's really a defined mixture of uh, herbs, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, I think actually uh, um, it can be, it, it is conceivable, mm. uh, uh, their clinical efficacy and also safety uh, can be compared mm. uh, in now clinical there, studies. There is an issue about traditional Chinese medicine. I'm not saying problem, mm. but rather an interesting issue. As we see some kinds of traditional medicine, even when they are being made uh, already with uh, well-designed uh, mm -hmm. and defined herbs, mm -hmm. um, could vary from one to another, mm -hmm. depending on which factory mm -hmm. they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So even with defined, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, shall I say, combination mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. herbs, mm -hmm. there could be minor differences. Mm -hmm. So how should we understand, once again, that mm -hmm. issue? That, that's a very important uh, point. Uh, but again, uh, that actually can be addressed uh, by, you know, modern uh, analytical method. Uh, we can actually use actually uh, very specific uh, analytical tools uh, to really uh, quantify actually uh, each component uh, uh, actually to, to make it a standard. So there's a misconception that the Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, cannot be you know, uh, trialed or proved uh, in Western countries. That's, that's not the case. Uh, actually, uh, there are actually already proved, uh, for example, green tea. Mm -hmm. It's a polyphenol extract. That, that was approved uh, in the Western country. And also, there, there are several other, actually, traditional Chinese medicine currently being trialed in the U.S., uh, in Europe. And actually, they, they really meet uh, those actually U.S. Or, or European regulatory requirements in terms of uh, standardization mm. of those different components. So that can be done. Uh, further to develop mm -hmm. on that, we talk about the science part, but what about the other complicated factors? How mm -hmm. do they filter in to this search of, therapeutic, of this mm -hmm. therapeutic treatment of COVID-19? For example, economic benefits, uh, whether one company has mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. IPR or the others have, uh, mm -hmm. whether that can be shared if mm -hmm. this becoming a pandemic, which is already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the other thing is, what about geopolitics? Mm -hmm. Will one country, one company has mm -hmm. the access to the real cure, mm -hmm. the others would also have access to it? So mm -hmm. these are Mm. complicated but actually also pragmatic issues mm -hmm. we have to th think about it. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Professor, from your mm -hmm. perspective? For this uh, COVID-19, uh, we've seen actually very significant uh, efforts from the biopharma industry. A uh, lot of uh, companies, uh, they're putting uh, resources at risk to develop therapeutics. Mm. So overall, uh, I think that's a, a very positive uh, a signal uh, actually, uh, we're mm -hmm. seeing uh, during this very difficult time, and whether there's uh, uh, still some uh, geopolitical consideration, uh, I think it, it could still uh, be in some people's mind. But I think, uh, as a community, uh, as an industry, uh, this is a global issue. Right. Uh, overall, I think um, people can really work together uh, uh, to really uh, uh, tackle this disease. Final question uh, for you, Professor. 
I have enormous amount of questions, but I think for now, final question mm -hmm. for you, Professor. Um, what do you think now are some of the most important priorities to put our resources in, in terms mm -hmm. of searching our way to a real therapeutic treatment, mm -hmm. even a real cure? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have limited resources, limited time, mm -hmm. limited global mm -hmm. pool of talents mm -hmm. in this. So what are the priorities? Uh, in my view, uh, our next priority is really to um, develop, uh, validate the vaccine. Uh, uh, only the vaccine actually uh, can really help us, you know, return to normal life. Because I would say currently uh, we do have, uh, you know, supporting treatment, uh, you know, uh, some other traditional Chinese medicine, remdesivir, and also some other, uh, you know, uh, uh, clinical candidates. Overall, we can really deal with this current situation, in my view. This is World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. The battle against coronavirus has not been limited to hospitals, with accusations and squabbles flaring up between nations. How can they better work together? And what's the impact of different history and cultural background on people's psychology, philosophy when facing this pandemic? We try to figure these out with Daniel Bell, the Dean of the School of Political Science and Public Administration at Shandong University. He is co-author of the book, Just Hierarchy, Why Social Hierarchies Matter in China and the Rest of the World. Let's listen to what he had to say. What do you make of the debate concerning, quote unquote, the origin of the virus? Well, I mean, I think it's too early to tell. We have to let the scientists um, determine the, the origin, but obviously the whole debate uh, is so politicized at the moment. Um, and it will, uh, in a way, it doesn't really matter what the origin is. The question is, how do we deal with it now and how do we mitigate uh, relapses in the future? I think that's more important now from a public policy perspective. Yeah, it is so politicized that many feel the same way. Why is it, do you think? Well, I mean, it's, it is a, a, one of the kind of black swans that really throws our ordinary way of life out of whack in a way that hasn't happened perhaps since wartime. So, um, so obviously there's, it's, going, it's bound to be a political issue. But in contexts like the United States where there's presidential elections in a few months, um, it's obviously even more likely to be used and misused by political leaders who, who want to gain votes rather than solve problems. Mm. And as a result of that, uh, for scholars like you, how do you see the latest debates? Well, um, so in the very beginning, uh, obviously um, there were some mistakes made on this side in, in this country. Uh, but then once I think the central authorities decided to enact a plan starting about January 23rd to deal with this uh, disease in a very, well, on the, on the face of it, it seemed very draconian, but now it seems like a, from, public, uh, from a health po policy perspective, it seems like a, a prudent thing to do. Um, then since then, I, I think that in China, more or less, um, the political system has done uh, quite, quite a good job at, at, at dealing with it. I mean, certainly if I compare it to where I'm from in, in Montreal, Canada, uh, where there was plenty of notice. I mean, here in China, we criticize leaders for taking um, maybe three or four weeks to, to get on board. But in Canada, they had a lot of time to prepare, they could, and, and yet they didn't. So it's not just something that's distinctive to the Chinese political system, unfortunately. Mm. Should China care about these kinds of uh, accusations? I mean, if there's blatantly false information, I mean, at the moment, the most urgent need is to have global cooperation to deal with this pandemic. And if there's demonization of the Chinese political system or of Chinese people um, that reduces the possibility of that cooperation, then it's something to worry about. So in, in my case, I was a bit surprised when I saw that a scholar that I 
respected a lot wrote something blatantly false that portrayed um, the Chinese government in a kind of immoral light as though it wanted to deliberately spread the disease abroad. So uh, I wrote something uh, criticizing that scholar. With so much misinformation flying around, how can we expect there will be real communication as, you know, inside China possibly and outside, uh, most of people are reading very different sources of information and some of these informations are totally uh, different from one another, even though about the same thing. Well, ultimately we have to trust um, the experts and I wrote a book called Just Hierarchy. If their hierarchy is based on knowledge and information or virtue, then we ought to respect those hierarchies. And in the case of uh, information, for example, about epidemics or pandemics, obviously the scientists are, who carry out rigorous studies um, are the ones whose, whose views should be respected. Um, so that's one start by trusting the sources that are published through a rigorous a review process. I mean, when it comes to um, ac academics and professional journalists, we expect standards of truth that are maybe higher than for ordinary people who say random stuff on the, in on the internet. So if they say something that's blatantly false, they need to be um, exposed. And, and as, as for political leaders, I mean, I think they have a duty when there's not evidence to support what they say, at least to be cautious and, and not to spread uh, misinformation. All economies and all countries, all governments have to struggle with a balance of choices. One is social distancing, even lockdown of cities and uh, people being quarantined. Well, on the other hand, there's always the right to job, the right to uh, movement, the right uh, right. to uh, enjoy life, right? So. What is the best way for this uh, balance? And who is right and who is wrong? When is the right time? When is the wrong time? Uh, how to do this balance? Does the ancient philosophy from China teach us anything? Um, well, Confucianism um, ha does prioritize values. And Confucianism is famous for its emphasis on moral education. but whether it's Confucius or Mencius or Xunzi or most of the other great Confucians, they all strongly emphasize that until you have a basic sense of material well-being, or to use modern language, until you kind of overcome poverty, it's very hard to think to spread morality. So there's a first priority, is to deal with poverty uh, provide for people's basic material well-being. I think that's another reason why the socialist tradition became so influential in China because it tapped into this older tradition. And then we can talk about the other stuff. Um, so, uh, so, so at, at least that's one thing that I think Confucianism and I think the, social, the socialist tradition also um, has, has right. I mean, but in the case of the pandemic, I mean, it is a political decision how we weigh these these different values that there's no right answer here. I mean, it really depends on how different cultures prioritize different values. Yeah. And because of the importance of reverence for elderly people here, that's, that's just, that's how things are going to be done here. And it might not be true in other countries. China has been accused of so many things. I mean, first of all, we're the origin of the virus. Of course, uh, as we all heard from the scientists, the origin of the virus is from the earth and therefore the human being as a whole have to deal with it. It's not that anyone invented it. So secondly, yeah, sure. when China tried to go out and fi try to support other countries uh, by supporting with uh, uh, masks and also huge manufacturing capacity, others say, oh, you're doing mask diplomacy. You're trying to buy your way or uh, masks your way uh, into uh, others' uh, favorable policy towards China. And then there's also uh, the accusation uh, one sort after another. So it seems that no matter what you do, there would always be negative accusations against you. Some are very groundless. So uh, I, I just feel confused about this current situation. Do you? Um, well, I mean, I think more or less there is strong support 
and gratitude um, for China when, when it sends um, mass and, med and medical help and expertise and without blatantly seeking anything in return. Again, if it's done in a humble way, um, there's much less likely to be a backlash. And I, so I, I'm not so pessimistic. I mean, I, I, I do think that in, in the long term, um, providing aid to those who are suffering, if it's done in a humble way, is likely to lead to better relations. I mean, the most worrisome part now is, is just in the U.S., where they're in a terrible situation, and they're looking for enemies, and it's election time. Um, and if we can get by this period without a disaster and the next leader um, is, is more, let's say, more rational and, and less likely to appeal to people's worst emotions, then I think that relation could be improved too. Mm. How should a country interact with the rest of the world when the West still have this attitude, apparently, of superiority, uh, of uh, ours is always better than yours? Uh, even if you do well this time, it's only a slight chance that you can do well. Ours, however, on the other hand, could always do better. Uh, so how would you deal with something like that? Um, I think it's maybe more of a problem in the United States where um, there's this widespread view that our way is the right way and it ought to be universally spread. I mean, there's more humility in smaller countries like Canada, for example, or in countries like uh, Denmark. Um, and uh, so. So I think it's more of a problem with this. I mean, on the one hand, I think we need to recognize that there are some universal values, like, for example, the right to life, that the way that governments are evaluated in dealing with COVID-19 is whether they've done well at respecting the right to life. And on this way, on this standard, obviously China has done well relative to countries like the United States, according to this value of the right to life, which is so important and, and, and a universal. Um, but in other ways, like what is the right way of selecting political leaders or which sorts of cultural systems should be prioritized or what's the right form of family life. I mean, we need to allow for diversity. And it, I mean, I think it's obvious for Chinese intellectuals that um, depend, you know, what's the right way of selecting leaders, for example, depends on a country's culture and national conditions, size, history, and so on. Whereas, um, I think it still is very strange view in most Western countries, most strongly held in the United States, that if you don't have our political system, you're fundamentally illegitimate. I mean, it's such a weird view, um, and, and we need to uh, fight against that, not so much by criticizing the system, but by just saying that it's appropriate for you guys, given your history and your culture, but please allow for a bit of diversity, and please right. uh, be tolerant in, in regard, regarding what we're doing here. And that will do it for this edition of World Inside. To find out more, you can always search us, World Inside CGTN, or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Bye.